Okay, so as you will all recollect and, and know by now, our, our, our theme for the seminar series this spring is engagement and all the different ways that we as people who live on this planet have the opportunity um, and perhaps the responsibility to get engaged in making a difference on a lot of the environmental issues that affect all of us. Uh, and I know there's a lot of people in this room that are really interested in how we actually go about engaging with the next generation of people who are going to inherit this planet after us. So there's a lot of folks that have a, a strong interest in environmental education. I'm glad to see some of you here today. Um, so that, that sort of focus on how do we train, how do we engage the next group of folks to come up and take over the mess that we're still trying to fix. And that focus on the next generation. How do we, how do we engage them? Uh, is really the topic tonight. And so we're really fortunate to have Seabar and Nachbar here with us this evening. Uh, so I'm going to just say a little bit about Seabury. Um, yes, it's her real name. Because <laughs> you were wondering, I know, yes, it's her real name. Uh, so like all of you, Seabury came up in the California State University system, although she is not a, a, not a native of California, so we'll begrudge her that. She's from Maine. It's a pretty cool place, I'm told. Uh, <laughs> Seabury did her undergraduate in marine biology at San Francisco State University and did a master's in fishery science at Moss Landing Marine Labs, which is also a Cal State system uh, marine lab. And she's going to tell you more about some of the really interesting opportunities to do neat science and neat ocean stuff and neat places between there and her current capacity. So I'll, I'll save that for her. But for basically the last two decades, Seabury has worked for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, which hopefully most of you will know is our, 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 our nation's ocean agency. Um, within, so NOAA is part of the Department of Commerce. You guys remember you get to do my class, we get to talk about the crazy federal organizational structure. NOAA, part of the Department of Commerce. Within NOAA, there's a National Ocean Service, which any of you that's into the ocean, that's just cool. We have a National Ocean Service. Within the National Ocean Service, there's an Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Uh, they're responsible for administering the National Marine Sanctuary Program, of which we have one right out here. Uh, within the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, um, Seabury, over the course of her career, has been probably not totally fair to say single-handedly, because we've cut some people out of the <laughs> equation, but has uh, been a powerhouse for creating educational opportunities, environmental educational opportunities for young people through that program. So the Bay Watershed Education and Training Program, the BWET program, that some of you are involved with through the grant that we have here at CI. This is a direct result of the brilliant things that happen inside her brain. Um, so Seabury really made that, made that program happen in the big picture. It exists in the United States of America because of, uh, and then we're also really fortunate to have a, 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 our own local grant here that some of you are, are really involved with, the Crossing the Channel program. Uh, so for all of those reasons, um, we're really fortunate to have you here today. Uh, I should say that this this whole thing is supported by the the NOAA uh, the, this, by the CSUCI IRA program, and normally we're able to support our speakers travel, but because we're a recipient of a grant from the program that Seabury runs, we weren't able to give her money because of ethical reasons, which makes sense when you think about them. Uh, <laughs> And so she's, she's here out of the goodness of her own heart. She's been camping in Leo Carrillo all week with her kids. And now she's here. So she has come to Southern California to talk to you guys and then made an adventure out of it for her family. So we're really fortunate for a lot of reasons. Thank you for being here. Uh, let me just turn the system on. Otherwise, we'll just be staring at it. So thank you. Big warm welcome, everybody. <laughs> um, I was fortunate enough to have, um, as you'll see in some of the pictures that I dug up from my parents' archive of photos, um, I was lucky enough to grow up um, exploring and had uh, parents who very much were in tune with the earth. And so this is actually a little fun fact that maybe Dan didn't know. My middle name is Windflower. <laughs> and so I was awesome. lucky enough to either go into marine biology, which I did with a name like Seabury, or I could have been a botanist. <laughs> or, an, or a pilot. Or a pilot. <laughs> um, so these, before I jump into the, my presentation, um, these are all photos that are taken in our 
uh, system of national marine sanctuaries. And so, as Dan said, I do work from NOAA, which houses the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, which are essentially underwater parks. And so, you know, we all have national parks that are on land. We also have national parks that are in the water. And there are a series of protected areas that Congress and the people, actually the communities, decided were special areas. Um, the very well-known one was actually up in Monterey, where they wanted to bring oil drilling up to that area. And the community got together and said, whoa, not on this coastline. We don't want that to happen on our coastline. So the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary was actually started up here. California has four um, sanctuaries. So it also kind of lets you know how important and ecologically diverse this area is. And we're so fortunate to have communities and congressional people to support these really special areas. So all of these pictures, like I said, were taken within the sanctuary. We have a wonderful campaign called Earth is Blue. Um, this is the little symbol here, the Earth is Blue symbol. They're all on our um, website and they're all free and they're high resolution. If you guys ever have need of photos or videos, this is a great place to go. It's called Earth is Blue and you can download any of them and use any of them however you would like. <laughs> okay, so I want you guys to envision a first date. <laughs> envision yourself as John Travolta or his little sidekick, <coughs> or a first date for an Eskimo couple. Was it love at first sight? Did you have that <laughs> special feeling? <laughs> Did you feel awe and wonder? <laughs> Did you feel at peace? Did you feel adventurous? Did you feel thrilled? Was it a thrilling experience? So now I want you to think about a first date with the ocean. Do you feel at peace? Do you feel a sense of awe and wonder? Some adventurousness, maybe a little bit thrilling? Do you have that special feeling? Or do you feel fear? Are you scared? Or do you fall in love with its beauty? Do you want to learn more? Or do you just want to get lost in its endless boundaries where there's no limitations? And now I want you to envision Santa Cruz Island. And you're walking on the beach of Santa Cruz Island. So now I'm going to play a little clip, ocean clip, just to kind of get you guys in the mood. Is that a little too loud? Yeah. <laughs> so I want you to imagine you're walking on this beach. And for those of you who'd like to close your eyes and really get into it, I was doing this with my kids and my kids were like, they're not going to want to close their eyes. <laughs> so that's you. <laughs> What do you smell? Do you smell salt? Do you smell fish? Maybe a little bit of that rotting kelp on the back of the tidal rack. Maybe a little bit of sunblock that you just put on that day. What do you hear? Do you hear seagulls overhead? Do you hear the waves pounding on the beach? Maybe there's some children out there. There's some people enjoying themselves having fun. What do you feel on your skin? Do you feel the hot sand under your feet? Do you feel the cold wind on your face? Do you feel the cool water on your legs? I'm really 
to take a moment to think, how do you feel inside? How does that make you feel inside? <coughs> so now, I'm going to bring you guys back. And we're going to start part one of our activity with the pieces of paper. And so now what I'd like you guys to do is write your name on the paper. And I'm going to ask you guys to help me list, as many as you can think of, some of the major environmental threats um, that, are, that we're facing these days. Some of the major issues that our environment is facing. And you guys can just raise your hand and I'll start writing them down. Yeah. And it's, it's okay to use this one here. Oh, yeah. Unless it's a sharpie. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. You want to be a little more specific? Microphone. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Overfishing. Yeah. Coastal population density. Wow. That was good. Coastal population density. Are there any that you guys run into on a daily basis in your daily lives? I mean, I'm not saying these no specifically, access. but other, other ones. No access? Yeah. The beach is either off limits to the public or just closed for the day because it's dirty. And yeah. Fossil fuel emissions? Can we say um, climate change, or do you want to go narrower than that? <coughs> okay. okay, now I want you guys to. <coughs> Think about those um, current environmental ocean-related threats. And think about one that you, in particular, associate with, something that kind of connected you, that you might have had experience with, that you might have learned about, something that you are passionate about. And just take a moment to look at the ones we wrote down. If there's other ones, let me know as you're kind of thinking about it, and I can add it to the board. Um, and then just write it down at the top of your piece of paper there as like the header. Does yeah. it have to be of just of these ones? No, if you think of other ones, go for it. And then maybe share with, with, the, with everyone else. So hold on to that. We're going to come back to that in a minute. And we're going to kind of continue to come back to it as I go throughout the presentation. And at the end, we'll figure out why. <laughs> so this is me. I don't know if you can see me here. That's me. <laughs> These were my first dates with the ocean. This was my first real experience of being outside. I mean, my earliest memories of being outside. And I was a, a wild child. I grew up wandering every summer, wandering the, the um, coasts of Maine, exploring in tide pools. I um, developed the soles of my feet were so were bare, and my feet were so bare so often that I had like leather feet. The soles of my feet were like leather. Dirt under my fingernails, my hair kind of wild. And I would spend a lot of time as a child exploring in tide pools, like looking in tide pools, lifting up rocks, picking up little creatures and putting them on my arm. That's what I'm doing here. I have a little polycute worm from a tide pool that's on my arm and I'm like poking it, <laughs> it and I remember lifting up rocks and kind of crouching down to wait because I understood at an early age that to really kind of figure out what's in the tide pool you have to be patient and wait and just like any scientist observe and so I was observing I was watching to see okay what's going to crawl out and I would patiently wait for it to scurry on by and I'd grab it and then pick it up and poke at it <laughs> um, in the name of science <laughs> <laughs> So these were really my first memories of my first dates 
my first connection with the ocean, but it's not just about the ocean, it's about the environment. <coughs> this is the opportunities that I had as a very young child to really make those connections. And as those opportunities, these experiences continue to happen, I developed a kind of sense of self. And those opportunities kind of contributed to who I am as a person today. Like I recognize now much more so than I did as a child that these opportunities experiences were like small layers that were building the foundation of who I am. And I created values based on those experiences. And I created priorities in my life based on those experiences. And they really shaped me. And I think that these, these experiences can happen at any point in your life. They don't have to just happen when you're young. They can happen really at any age. And they really help shape you. And they more so help shape you when you have a connection with your outdoors, with your environment. And so I wanted to just give you a little taste of my first date with the ocean, with the environment. And then I was wondering if anyone else would like to share your first date with the ocean. Do you have any young memories, any opportunities that you remember as a child of like being out in nature? It could have been camping with your, with your parents or taking a walk on the beach with your grandparents. I asked Dan to share if he wanted to, but we decided maybe to let you guys give it a go first. Does anyone have any like first memories? And it could have been yesterday or last week when you went surfing or you were taking a walk on the beach. Like those first opportunities, those first connections. Yeah. At some point in elementary school, we had like a field trip. We went out on the boat. And I was really little, so I don't remember mm -hmm. much about it. But I remember we like netted up a bunch of like fish and stuff and <laughs> like put cups when like looked at them with microscopes to see all the plankton and like I just remember like it just blowing my mind that yeah. like I'd never seen beneath the surface before so it's like I saw this huge ocean but I didn't realize I had no idea. what was going on underneath and then like and then like boots came up too so it's like <laughs> like yeah, I remember thinking like that's so weird that like Boots live down there, and like <laughs> fish live down there, and like, and then there's all this tiny stuff that's in there too, and like, and I, I thought it was just cool that you were able to like, get a hold of that, like I was right. able to like touch like a little fish or something, and like, like, and like, I don't know, it just blew my mind that like yeah. that was there, and that we could, like, engage with it like that, and yeah, yeah. I think a lot of our first experiences connecting with nature are um, usually the school with these you know, science camps or field trip opportunities that you have in the K through 12 um, education system. Um, and we're very lucky that um, we live in a state that supports that, um, supports those opportunities to do that. Does anyone else want to share? Yeah, I'll share. Um, I actually, my first memories were actually my grandmother's backyard. She <laughs> lived in a very small area in the Poconos in Pennsylvania, which if you know where the Poconos are, they, they don't have sidewalks, so <laughs> let's just put it that way. <laughs> um, so her backyard was signified the end was the rock that looks like a throne by the river. So <laughs> that's great. You know, so I would go outside and, you know, you'd see wild deer, wild turkeys, mm -hmm. and just those summers spending my time with my grandmother outside. Thank you. I had a, I have a very good friend of mine who um, taught at the Monterey Bay Aquarium for a long time. She was an education specialist there. And um, she said, you know, it's funny because a lot of people talk about their first experiences connecting with nature. And the way that I connected with nature was actually through National Geographic. <laughs> she said I would spend hours watching you know, these explorers go out and explore the world. And she said that was where my connection came. So there was a lot of meaning to, for me in her saying that because I realized that these experiences don't necessarily always have to be outdoors. Preferably they are, but you can make that connection through media as well. So this is uh, another picture of me. And so once I kind of got the taste um, and it was in my blood, I kind of created this, what I call the love affair with the ocean. I started just really becoming, like really 
obsessed with it. Like I wanted to know more about it. And I said, well, what is out there? What, what more is there to learn? And so I realized that I wanted to go to school. And, but I didn't really realize like, what I wanted to study. My mom, I remember, um, at like 12 or 13, took me to SeaWorld. I grew up in Southern California. She took me to SeaWorld in San Diego. And I remember going to watch the train, you know, when they were training the dolphins, and going, oh, that's what I want to do, is be a dolphin trainer. <laughs> <laughs> because at the time, I didn't know there was anything else. You know, I had no idea that you could, there was so much more to being a marine biologist, a person in the marine field, than being a dolphin trainer. Um, so I went to our local community college in San Fernando Valley, uh, Pierce College, and I started taking classes. And I took um, one of the few community, um, the one of the few marine biology courses there, and that quickly um, catapulted me into a field study program that I did through Pierce Community College, where I got to go and live <coughs> for three months in Baja. It was so fun. <laughs> And we lived on this little field station um, in Bahia de Los Angeles that the community college had a, some kind of partnership with, with um, the folks down there. And we, we slept on cots every night and under the stars. And then every day, we were in the city of Cortez studying. And we could, de we could decide what we wanted to study. Like we, you know, we could come up with our hypothesis and then create an, exper an experiment about that. And so we had the underwater writing tablets, and I had my snorkel. And this was like my first time, actually, for me diving into the ocean. And my mind was blown away <laughs> when you actually got in there and you started seeing coral, coral reefs and the fish that are associated with those reefs and all the invertebrates that are associated with those coral reefs. Has anyone have? How many people have been snorkeling and seeing coral reefs? Isn't it just like astounding? Yeah. You know, and the neat thing about like being able to put on a snorkel and a mask is you can do it anywhere. You could go out here and do it, and you'll be blown away what you see. It's just mind. It's it, it's such an expansion of your mind to know that there's so much more under there than you would ever know. And the thing about this for me was that. I could be out there for hours. I would just be paddling along, snorkeling, taking my notes. And I just really, my love affair with the ocean continued because I was just amazed at what there was out there. And then I thought, OK, now I'm going to go and I'm going to start applying to schools. And so I went to San Francisco State University. And um, I, I got a job working for a graduate student at San Francisco State University who was hired by pg and &E. Um, to go look at the high Sierra streams um, and look at when they were doing a lot of the intake for the power from these streams and these, these high Sierra rivers, they wanted to see what kind of impact they were making on brown um, trout and uh, juvenile brown trout and rainbow trout. And so he needed people to go and do the hard work, <laughs> which is putting on these dry suits because it's, it's snow melt. So you can imagine how cold it is. <laughs> You put on these dry suits, and then underneath you're wearing full-on gear, wool socks, caps, and then you put on the dry suit. Cool. And then you go out and you float in a river <laughs> <laughs> with your little snorkel sticking up, looking for juvenile brown and rainbow trout. And you know we were peeking under rocks, and but it was really cool. It was so fun. And and at the time I was one female, one female with a bunch of old <laughs> males, <laughs> old guys. They were the pg e guys. And then my friend from um, my undergraduate program came and joined me. And so there were two females to the 10 or so men that were there. But it was like a great opportunity for me to really see uh, what it's like to just do science and to be out there and also make the connection that there's a lot more than just your ocean. There's a whole watershed connection. It goes way up into the high Sierras. And so for me, it really put two and two together where I was like, oh, yeah, I'm doing research way at the top of the watershed and in the ocean. So that was a really fun job. You guys get the opportunity to go and volunteer for a graduate student, do it, because it's a really good learning opportunity. I really recommend it. 
And then I finished up school and I got a job on the East Coast. And so all of a sudden my, ex my world of the ocean expanded to all of a sudden include the Atlantic Ocean. And I got a job um, working for the um, US Fish and Wildlife Service. Actually, I'm sorry, the Department of Natural Resources. And we, have you guys ever seen these electroshocking backpacks? Mm -hmm. you're, you're basically carrying around electricity on your back <laughs> with this that little wand. Mm -hmm. And you walk into these way back far mm -hmm. creeks with this wand that shoots out electricity. I know, it sounds crazy. And you have rubber on so you don't get electrocuted. And you walk way up these streams and you go zzz, zzz, and what happens is it shocks the fish. And so all the fish kind of come up to the top, but they're shocked just for a second. And so you're following behind with a big net and a bucket to scoop them up. And so what we were doing is we were doing um, kind of a species diversity count of what kind of fish are on these um, Atlantic streams that are off of the Chesapeake Bay. And also looking for, these are elvers. These are um, juvenile eels called elvers. And they wanted to see what was happening to the, elk, um, the eel population. It was, it was rapidly declining. And so we wanted to figure out how many there were, where they were going, what was happening. And so a big part of my job was actually looking for these little teeny, um, very see-through animals <laughs> in the way up creeks of Chesapeake Bay. Um, and the cool thing about the eels, as I put this picture of the Sargasso Sea, is that they all congregate there from the East Coast um, and the Atlantic. They all congregate in the Sargasso Sea to mate. Like all of the eels. It's weird. <laughs> 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 they all go to the Sargasso Sea. <laughs> like, and, like you think about that and you go like, wow, that's really cool. How do they know how to do that? How do they know when to leave? So again, my, my mind was expanding. And I was like, wow, science is cool. Studying the ocean is cool. This is cool stuff. And then I came back to the West Coast and I got accepted into the Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, which again is part of the state university system. It's a great program. And I started my thesis project, which was going out every day on a boat. And um, these are called bongo nets, they're plankton nets. And it was during the El Nino, the 92 El Nino. And at that time, they didn't know what was happening with fish larvae, ichthyoplankton and warmer waters. So that's what happens when you have the El Nino. So you have these warmer waters. They didn't know what was happening to the fish. Um, some of our most viable commercial fish, they didn't know what was happening to them. Like, do the populations go up, do they go down? And so I was going out pretty regularly, um, getting seasick a couple times. So I'll tell you a funny story. <laughs> <laughs> I don't usually get seasick, but this was a really bad day. And it was bumping, bumping, bumping. And I had my professor, and this other woman who is like legendary at Moss Landing Marine Lab was out, uh, Mary Yaklovich. She's like the rockfish person when I was studying rockfish. And so I was like trying to chat it up with them, you know, be a cool graduate student, just chatting them up. And I was feeling in my stomach, like, oh, no, I think I'm going to get sick. I'm chatting with them, and I think, oh, it's coming. It's, there's no stopping them now. And so I turn over, <laughs> let it go, turn back, wipe it off, and I continue calling. <laughs> didn't even phase them. They didn't even <clears throat> say a word. <laughs> but again, because you looked another, away. That's right. <laughs> that's right. I didn't puke on their shoes. So. <laughs> uh, but this was really fun. It was great to be out on the mighty Pacific, just to be out there, you know, far enough where you couldn't even really see the shore. So we had um, specific sampling stations, some of them far away, where you could just be out there. And like I was talking earlier about these endless boundaries, like, wow, there's so much out there. So that was a really great opportunity for me to do that. And then I graduated, and I got a job on the East Coast again, and I worked for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so isn't this fish wild? <laughs> That's a sturgeon. They are prehistoric fish. They're wild, wild animals. And my job, I did this for two years. I went fishing every day, except if it was like seriously hardcore storms. But every day on the Chesapeake Bay going out, again, dry suits, bundled up, winter storms, you're out there. And we were setting these um, gill nets, these single, single mesh gill nets, and setting them on buoys 
and we would leave them out for a couple hours and come back because we were what we were looking for was sturgeon. We were looking for Atlantic sturgeon in the Chesapeake. Again, it was a question like, are there sturgeon still here? How many are there? Where do they go? Did they leave the Chesapeake Bay? Did they go upstream? Again, these are like questions where you think, wow, we still don't know the answers to these. And the cool thing is when we catch a sturgeon, so another little side story. So I did this for two years, and we caught three sturgeon, <laughs> every day fishing, three sturgeon. I can't even tell you again, in the name of science, but there was a lot of bycatch, a lot of bycatch. Um, and it's kind of unfortunate because it's like, you know, you feel so bad because so many fish get stuck in these. They're called gill nets because the fish get stuck, their gills get stuck. And sometimes you can't really take them out delicately enough, and so their gill plates just kind of get snapped off. Um, but so, yeah, three sturgeon in the amount of time that I was doing this, and we would bring them up on, so we'd catch one, which was super exciting. We'd bring it up on board, we'd anesthetize it. So basically put them to sleep for a short amount of time, flip them over, cut open their body cavity, put in a transmitter inside, and sew it back up, <laughs> flip the fish back over, stick it in the water, try to revive it a little bit, and then let it go. <laughs> and you have to do it very fast, because <laughs> you don't want to harm the animal too much. And then what we would do is try to track these animals by sticking a radio um, transmitter into the water <coughs> and actually identify a certain beeping sound. You could say, oh, well, there's one of our fish that we just tagged here or there or here. And so we we're actually able to kind of figure out where these, where these sturgeon were going and how many there were. And so then when I was working for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, I got um, offered a job at NOAA or applied for a job at NOAA. Um, to be a fisheries scientist. And I worked for um, the, uh, the kind of the science branch of the National Ocean Service. And I quickly discovered that I was doing really cool field work. I loved it. But my career path took a turn. And all of a sudden I realized like what I really like doing is telling other people about how cool the ocean is and how cool the environment is. And like marine education, I love that idea of like having other people really experience what I experienced and sh telling other people how cool it would be to connect with your environment. And so I had the opportunity to start developing programs where you try to engage kids at a young age or any age, the public even, the general public, with their environment. Like make that connection with what is around you in your outside world. Like what is out there? And if you don't know what's out there, get outside and explore. Have an adventure outside. And so I started um, the, a couple programs there. Um, but I quickly came to realize, well, like, how do you do that? How do you make a connection with a young person or a person if they haven't had that opportunity? How do you even start? And I realized that you know, kind of formulating this, this presentation that there's essentially three ways that I found. I'm sure there's more. But the first thing is there's an innate biology to us. We have a blue mind. Have you guys heard of Jay Nichols? He's starting this new revolution called the blue mind. And so there's an innate part in us that's already there. And then you also want to be able to educate people. You want to give them the know-how and the tools and the resources to know what is there. And like, once you know about it, what do you do with that information? And then the most important thing that I'll get into a little bit is providing the opportunity and the experiences to get out there. Because that's the essential part to it all, is providing these opportunities for people to connect outside. Not inside, but outside. And a lot of it is just taking kids outside and learning in the environment figuring out like how things work and really tying it to what they're learning in the classroom. So this is the idea of the blue mind. So this is Jay Nichols. This is the innate part of it. And um, Jay um, has this uh, philosophy that it's, it's your brain on ocean. <laughs> and so that there's a part of you. So our Earth is 70%, more than 70% blue. And that's what this blue marble represents, is that he has these blue marbles that he passes on to many, anyway, anytime he does a presentation, he passes a blue marble on. He wants you to pass it on to other people to remind them that the earth is blue, actually. It's not land, it's mostly water. But then also, our bodies are more than 70% water. 
And so we have this biology in us already to be near water. Like we have this innate desire to be near water. And they're doing these studies now that are showing it makes you calm. It puts you at ease. It makes you a better person. If you have the opportunity to listen to water, be near water, engage with water, you become a better person and more calm and more self-assured. And they've actually like hooked up, you know, for their neurological stuff that's going on in your brain. They see that once people kind of are confronted with water, that that part in your brain that shows anxiety and stress is reduced. It's calm. And there's actually, I'm working with this woman, Tierney Tees, who's a um, National Geographic explorer, actually. And she's been doing these studies with jails where they actually, um, you know, in the waiting rooms or in the visiting rooms, they put murals up of the ocean. And they're finding that the stress level and anxiety level in these jails is really decreasing just with that connection of looking at the ocean. That's that innate biology that you have in you. You already have this predisposition to be calm and at ease when you're around the ocean. So that's the innate part of it. Then there's the education part of it. And that's a lot of what I do now. Um, I, I sit on a steering committee for the California Department of Education. And California is saying, we need to have kids that are graduating from high school that are environmentally literate, that they know about the environment. They know their role in the environment and the environment's role on them. This is important to us as a state. We want every school to teach about the environment because our children are graduating from high school and they don't know about the environment. They don't know what's out there. They don't know their impact on the environment. And so they came up with this um, blueprint for environmental literacy. And I'm on the steering committee to kind of figure out, okay, well, so now we're saying every kid should do this, but how do you actually do that? How do you get schools to implement environmental literacy standards? So I've been very fortunate to be able to be a part of that where I'm looking at this big picture approach to making sure that students can connect to the environment. And then, in addition to the BWEB program, I also run a program called the Ocean Guardian School Program. And this is a really great program that works directly with schools. We provide small <coughs> grants to schools. It's a teacher that comes up and says, I want to do a stewardship project on my school campus. And we provide a small grant for them to do that. They can choose any type of pathway. They can look at marine debris. They can do reduce, reuse, recycle, rot. They can look at uh, restoration activities. And we provide the small grant to do that and actually the capacity to do that. And so I wanted to just show you guys this video. It's a only two minute video. Everything is interconnected with us and all of it goes back to the ocean. Our school is a NOAA Ocean Guardian School. All the students work together to help keep our watershed and ocean clean. This is especially important because the ocean and the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary are in our backyard. When the ocean collapses, so will we. The plastic goes to the ocean. And, and animals eat it and they die. And it's really, really bad. And we're so Reduce, reuse, recycle, and re rethink. We are responsible for more tonnage of recyclables than any other school in the district. This Ocean Guardian grant is affecting the school as a whole. Apply reusable stuff to help the ocean. The restoration team goes down to the creek and helps preserve it and clean it and plant native plants. Our students are just empowered. They know that they have the power to affect the pollution that's going into the ocean and make a difference. For them to see that come to life through NOAA's Ocean Garden program is something that they will take with them for the rest of their lives. And will the world be a We can really make a difference. After all. And uh, the really cool thing about that.
that program is that it, it ties education with resource protection. So every school that gets a grant, they have to take measurable data. They have to tell me how many pounds of trash they removed from the beach, how many invasive plants they removed, how many um, native plants they put in, how many um, kilowatt per hour of uh, energy they saved, that they're doing that. It's a great program that really ties resource protection with education and teaches kids how to go about doing that in their daily lives. And so I'm, I'm highlighting this. Um, I was actually, I took a picture, so I was, I was boogie boarding on Tuesday with my kids, and I took a picture of my toes and the, the ocean in the background, because I wanted to show you guys that even to this day, I continue to try to have dates with the ocean. <laughs> and for me, it's really important to not only for me to have dates with the ocean, but I want to make sure to have other people, like my kids and the people that are important to me, have dates with the ocean. And so I continue to connect with the ocean every day. And these connections, like I said, are really helping to shape me still to this day and really put focus and emphasis on who I am, what I have values in, what my priorities are. But also I'm teaching that to my kids. I'm telling them this is important to me. And because this is important to me and because I'm building a memory with it's associated with this place, I want to protect this place. And so that's the bridge that now is being transferred, is I'm making these memories for my kids, I've made these memories, and now I want to take the step to protect those because I've associated these experiences, they're part of my memory, and if something happens to that place, if something happens to that beach, I'm going to be there to protect it because it's important to me because I have memories associated with that. And that's how stewardship happens. That's how you make the bridge to stewardship. And that's the crucial piece here, the part that's hard to do, but once you can provide those opportunities for kids and young people to develop a connection with a place, with a special place, all of a sudden they're going to want to know that that place is protected, and they're going to do what needs to be done to protect it. And what I've kind of coined that term is they become environmental warriors. And so all of us have the capacity to be an environmental warrior. And unfortunately, the day that we are living in currently, we are in a battle. We're in a battle to protect our environment, to protect our ocean. And it's a battle that we have every day. And so these environmental warriors can be any age. They can be four years old. They can be 84 years old. And you can have these, these experiences and these environmental know-hows at any age, from four to 24 to 84. <coughs> and so what I wanted to do is provide you guys a little synopsis as an environmental warrior. Some I know, some I don't know, some I looked up online. Mm -hmm. And in this environmental battle, you have to have weapons, right? You need to have weapons to do this environmental battle. And the cool thing is that you guys actually have these weapons on hand. And they're very accessible to you. You can use them at any time. I know it sounds a little cheesy, but it's really true. You have your voice. You have your hands. You have your heart. <laughs> I forgot the last one. <laughs> you have your voice, your heart, your hand, and your mind. So those, are the, so those are the four of the weapons that you guys have on you right now. And what I'm going to do is kind of show you other env environmental warriors that have used these weapons to fight the environmental battle. So this is Merritt and Marlo. They are from Virginia. And two kids, I think they were <coughs> four and six or something like that. And they were romping the neighborhood every day, like you know, after school, having fun, playing. And they started picking up plastic. They were like realizing that the streets were just being completely littered with plastic. And so they wanted to do something about it. And so they decided to start the plastic patrol. Yeah, these two kids. So they're using their hands for the environmental battle. They're using their hands to kind of fight this battle. And so every day they'd go up and do the plastic patrol. And what that did was kind of encourage other people to go, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? And then this kind of this connection happened where other people started seeing these young kids doing it. And they all started doing it together. And to date, I just looked this up the other day, to date they have collected over 6,000 pounds of plastic from their community, from their streets. Um, and they're still going at it. 
This is Greg. He used his mind in the environmental battle. Greg is from Ohio, and he was a competitive runner. And an injury kind of took him out of uh, cross country. And so he thought, well, I'm sitting here in bed, you know, resting my leg, my full hamstring. And so I'm going to use my mind to try to think of creative things I can do for the environment in this environmental war. And he started the program called Get Running, where he collected used running shoes from his friends and then from his family members and started collecting more and more running shoes to donate them to people who couldn't afford running shoes. And to date, he's collected over 3,000 pairs of shoes that he then provides to others who are in need of running shoes. These guys I was fortunate enough to um, meet, um, they're um, Miladi and Isabel. They're from Bali, Indonesia. I've never been to Bali, but I've seen the pictures of Bali. It's <laughs> a fantastic place, <laughs> seems like it. Beautiful white sandy beaches. And they were tired of seeing that their beaches were covered in plastic trash. They said, this shouldn't happen, this shouldn't be happening. And so they created a campaign called the Bye Bye Plastic Campaign. And they used their voice. They used their voice in this environmental battle. And they approached the governor of Bali. And they said, they showed them. They actually went out and collected trash. They showed them the data. And they said, this shouldn't be happening on our beaches. Why are we allowing this to happen on our beaches? And the governor agreed that it was not all right. And he agreed to ban plastic bags. So as of 2018 this year, Bali has banned plastic bags. And that's because of these two girls, because they use their voice to fight the environmental battle. And then the really cool thing, too, that I just found out about is the Bali and Palau. Bali um, has a pledge now. So when you fly into Bali, before you're even allowed out of the airport, you have to sign a pledge to be an environmental um, advocate, to really be aware of the environment and do everything you can to protect the environment. So they, people have to, all the tourists have to sign pledges for that now. Because of those two girls? Because of those two girls. Those and actually, and the really cool thing for these girls too, so I just, uh, we were just at the um, International Marine Debris Conference in San Diego, it was a couple weeks ago, and um, both of them spoke there. Um, they were really quite composed, like amazing girls. But now what they've done is they've kind of taken to the next level, and so they've hired the women of the small villages outside of Bali to make uh, bags that then the community uses. They sell these bags. Half of the money goes to the Bye Bye Plastic Campaign. Half of the money goes to the community, not to the women, but to the community. And the community decides how best to use it to protect their environment. It's a really neat program. And it's because of these girls. And again, they're just using their voice. How old are they? Um, at the time that I saw them, so she's 17 and 15, but they started this when they were like 10 and 13. Yeah. Again, it's like, it's not, I mean, and I, I wanted to highlight these girls because this is kind of one end of the spectrum, but it's really important that you guys understand that being an environmental warrior, using the weapons that you have on hand can be any level. It can be small, it can be big. It really can be any level. And then this is um, Alex and Jack. This is Carmel Beach, California. And these are two high school students. They're friends, and they spent a lot of time in the water. They were surfers, um, did some free diving as well. And you know, there's the Pebble Beach Golf Course that's on the north end of Carmel Beach. Very famous golf course. <laughs> and they started free diving just below the golf course and started discovering that there's a lot of golf balls down there, like thousands, thousands of golf balls. And so just started picking them up because they would be swimming out there and they'd be like, I can't just swim by this. I got to do something about this. And so they started collecting the golf balls. And uh, to date, they, I mean, it's like 10,000 golf balls. It's a ridiculous amount um, that still continues to get put into the ocean. They've approached the Pebble Beach Company to see if they can do something to stop that, to prevent it, or at least educate the caddies and the, the players. Um, so they're trying to work that a little bit. But they still continue to go out and collect golf balls. Kind of what's what they, that's like their weekend activity. 
And again, they're just using the tools that they have on hand, which is their heart, because they are passionate about doing this. And they're doing this because they really care, because they spend time at Carmel Beach, they surf Carmel Beach, they're there at Carmel Beach. The last tool, so how many of you guys have a cell phone? <laughs> just about everyone. Your cell phone is the secret weapon of the environmental battle. Your cell phone can be a very powerful tool that you can do in the comfort of your living room, on school campus, wherever you are. It can be a tool that you can use to track and monitor yourself. There are really neat apps where you can figure out how much energy you're using a day and try to reduce it. There are apps that allow you to figure out different tips, like what can I do today? How can I be green today? There's the Seafood Watch program, which if you guys are seafood eaters, you can choose sustainable seafood choices. There's um, these two cool apps, Literati. I don't, have you ever, you guys heard of Literati before? Mm -hmm. It's a really cool app. <coughs> it's it's um, where you can be basically a citizen science person. Um, and if you see a piece of trash, you, you can download this app. You see a piece of trash, you can take a picture of it with the, with the GPS coordinates and upload it to the Literati global, global database of trash, of litter. And what they're doing in this global perspective is providing areas hotspots. And so you can see where the trash accumulates and then work with city, county, governments to try to reduce the trash. And so a very good example that they had is um, San Francisco hired Literati and some of the high school students, the local high school students, to go out and figure out where the hot spots in the city were. They figured out two spots. One was where a lot of people were depositing cigarette butts. And so they put in a receptor, a recy uh, recycling receptor for cigarette butts. And there's also this other really great company called TerraCycle. You guys heard of that? They take things like cigarette butts, things that are really hard to recycle, and they take these cigarette butts and they create them into like park benches <laughs> and like um, parking bumper stoppers. Um, they also take like chip bags that are really hard to recycle. So they figure out ways to recycle things that are very hard to recycle. But um, Literati helped San Francisco identify these hot spots. There was another hot spot where they kept them finding over and over and over again a bunch of 7-Eleven products, wrappers from 7-Eleven. And sure enough, a block away was 7-Eleven where all the kids go to, you know, after school to get their snacks. And as they're walking home, they're depositing it. And so they work with 7-Eleven to help them educate them about how they can prevent this litter from being deposited in San Francisco. It's a cool app, you guys should check it out. And again, it's a global database, which is kind of cool. And then there's the NOAA Marine Debris Tracker, which you can use too, it's an app. And again, you can just download this and you can become a citizen science. Um, you can be part of a monitoring network. Okay, so now I'm gonna wake you guys up a little bit. And we're gonna go back to our activity. So you guys have put your name, you've identified one of the marine issues that you most closely associate with. And what we're gonna do now is I want you guys, again, remember that in, being an environmental warrior isn't about a thing. It's not about a big event. It's about an everyday action that anybody can do. Starting tomorrow, you can be the next environmental warrior by just going out there and picking up a piece of trash. Going home and bringing your mom, your brother, your nephew, your grandpa to the beach. That's an, that's an environmental warrior. Introducing other people to how to connect with their own environment, the area that they live, make that date. And so with that one issue you guys have on your piece of paper, we're going to start generating a list of small actions that each of us can take. And so I want you to write down, you guys, and you're going to have like 30 seconds to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to write down one action underneath the environmental issue that you can do to help fight that threat. And then you're going to pass it to your right. And the next person has to add on to there something different that they can do then to help with that one action. Does anyone have any questions about that? And 
and it's preferable if you guys don't duplicate the actions, if you can try to think of new ones. And again, it doesn't need to be something big. It can be something small. Does anyone have any questions? OK, go. <laughs> Faster right. <laughs> okay, can anyone call like roughly how many you have down on the paper? Like five or six? Five? Yeah, five. Okay. Let's try to get maybe one more in there, one more action. <laughs> Okay, do you guys have a sense that there might be overlap, that there might be similar, like similar actions that you can take? <laughs> Would anyone like to share their list? <laughs> yeah. Okay, we got someone sharing. So the topic is trash in our oceans, and they said don't use straws, recycle, reuse reusable products, and trash pickups and law changes to prevent the pollution. Excellent. That's great. Anyone else want to share? Just going for uh, ocean acidification. The actions we can do is reduce driving time, reduce carbon emissions, um, increase recycling. That's good. And did you want to share? Uh, small actions, beach cleanups, earth week cleanup at schools, get the community together, and plant trees. That's a good one, yeah. Yeah. So uh, by my hope was that you guys can actually take a picture of that list if you have it in front of you and just remember it because, again, it's, it's not... For me, the message I really want you guys to take away with is that being engaged with the environment, being connected to the environment, isn't, it's not an event. It's not a thing. It's an everyday action. Every day you can do something small to really help. And I think a really important way to help others um, engage with, the, with their environment, with the ocean, is by talking about it. And that's a really easy thing all of us can do. Um, I have a 15-year-old daughter who, um, so I've been an environmental educator, as Dan said, for almost two decades. And she came up to me about a month ago, and she, she goes, Mom, I'm so depressed. <laughs> and I said, what's going on? And she goes, because it was when all the wildfires were happening. And she was like, I just feel like it's so out of control. Like, I don't have any, there's nothing I can do to stop all this. Like, how do I stop this? Like, what kind of environment am I growing up into? And I said, you know what? There's a lot of good things that people are doing. Like people are really on the ground working. They're passionate. They're really doing a lot to help protect the environment. And she said, well, why don't I ever hear about it? Why don't I know about these stories? I never hear that. And so I think one of the best things that you can do is not only do the action, but share what you're doing here, what you're doing on this campus, what you're doing by going out and going surfing or taking a walk or going hiking in the mountains. Talk about it. If you're riding your bike to school, if you're trying to reduce your energy, if you're picking up trash, share it. Let other people know because I think there's a real sense of, of uh, there's like a wildfire that can start when you start sharing with other people and the, the community will engage in that. And there's a lot about peer pressure too, I'll tell you. <laughs> so, and I'll tell you a good example of this is I carry around, this is like one of the most, the most useful things you can have. Yeah. <laughs> I, I carry this around. I use this all. I use it tonight at dinner, all the time. My spoon, my chopsticks, my straw, my knife, and then this is a cool little thing. This is actually a, I picked this up at the Marine Debris Pots. Yeah, one of the two. <laughs> I use this all the time, and just by doing, other people go, oh, why are you doing that? And then you're engaging in a conversation. It's like that simple, and all of a sudden, I'm an environmental warrior. It's really simple to do. Um, and the last thing I wanted to share with you guys, um, one thing I failed to mention for your cell phone, so that all those envelopes are supposed to represent, you guys have a voice. I am telling you, you guys are in the movement now of having a voice. 
your Congress people, your representatives, the people that you guys elect, listen. So if you haven't registered to vote, vote. It's so important to put people in positions that have authority, that agree with your values. So please vote if you can. And you've seen this big movement that we've been having with gun, gun safety, stricter rules. The environment is just the same thing. You have the power to make a difference of who's in office. You really do. So the last thing I'll just leave you with, so you guys have the biology already. It's in you. It's an innate biology. You're part water. You're already connected. You have your list of actions, the things that you can do, simple actions every day that you can do to help protect the environment and the ocean. And I want to know now, when's your next date with the ocean? When is your next date with your environment? What are you going to do tomorrow, this weekend, the next day? When are you going to get outside and connect with the ocean? So that's it. Thank you. Thank you.